Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! Hi, Anthony here from the rainy Turin today. Um, unfortunately, the weather is not really good, but uh, who cares about that since we still cannot go outside due to the pandemic. And also because yesterday I had a beautiful encounter with a stranger that looked me in the eye and said, I'm gonna shoot you in the face. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> so I think I'll stay in-house for, for a while now. Uh, these are hard times. Hard times, but hard times create strong people. And uh, people that love to help each other, that care for each other. Inglorious people. Hi, Angelo. Buongiorno, amici, says in, it in a perfect Italian. <laughs> Hi, Angelo. So... I think we can start right away, but before that, I want to sh give a shout out. Uh, if you haven't watched the previous stream, Wednesday, last Wednesday stream, do it. Not now, maybe, but after this one, you should see it. Because uh, apart from the usual exercises on objects, we also did a very nice exercise about how to uh, inspect, change, fix and test other people's code. I think this is really, really useful and uh, uh, probably I should have done it in the in the Saturdays uh, because I have more audience, but um, it happened <laughs> and uh, I still believe that we should go forward with the program during Saturdays. Speaking of which, uh, today is lesson number 18. Hi Sao, good morning everyone. Um, today's lesson 18, and we were supposed to finish on lesson 20, 21-ish. Uh, the slide is slide number 13, but don't worry, because uh, today I think we're going to cover some or even all of the JS data types. I don't think we will do much about functions and even inheritance. I'll show you uh, in the future day just errors, asynchronous behavior, modules and maybe something on the browser so we can create a real a real thing. Hi, Tiago, good morning. But um, I don't know if we can make it in, uh, let's say, four lessons. The problem, the, the bad news is that starting from April, probably, I will have to do another thing, a job, in uh, every Saturday morning, uh, from starting from the beginning of April. So I won't be able to do the Inglorious Academy in these days. The good news is that if you're okay with that, we can just move it to Sundays. I don't know if Sunday is as good as Saturday for you. Uh, but I will keep you updated. Um, I don't know if I have to move the Inglorious Academy in, uh, in three weeks or so. Uh, but if I will, well, stay tuned because I'll tell you every single day I can. Uh, until everyone got the message. Okay, let's go with objects. I saw from your side uh, a good feedback on objects. Uh, I The feeling that, that I have is that you have a solid foundation on variables and values, and so objects did not went that bad for you. In fact, you even started understanding by yourselves how an object should behave, which is pretty impressive as a result. Uh, this is exactly what I, what I hoped for. So we already saw how to create object literals and we understood what, what, it, what does it mean to have a reference to an object, which means that you attach a label to an object, which means that if you have two labels, they can refer to the same object, which is different from what you see, what we saw so far with uh, uh, primitive values, because primitive values, whenever you create a new variable that refers to another variable, it creates a copy of that value, not with objects. Objects use references. And today we're going to look at methods. So, we already know a little bit what a method is. In fact, a method is nothing that, uh, but a function that belongs to an object. So, this object here is a plain object with two properties and no methods. But then I can attach uh, a function as a property of an object. And this function is usually called a method. And that's it. That's, it's the only thing that you need to know uh, for methods. 
Although, um, there are other things that we can say. So, um, let me show them to you with some examples. So, let's do a similar thing to what we saw in the tutorial. I'm going to create a const user. And the user has a name. And I will use my name and my age. My current age as of 2021. Am I 38 already? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'm going towards the 39. Yeah. So I've got the user. It has two properties. If I want, I can attach a new property to the user by using dot notation or a square bracket notation, such as user dot, I don't know, happy is equal to true. Okay. Or I can attach a function. So for example, uh, user.speak is a reference to an anonymous function. Look at this. I'm using a function expression, right? This is a function expression. I'm declaring an anonymous function and I'm attaching it as a property of an object. That's why function expressions are still relevant, still useful. And user.speak can, for example, say the user's name. I can do something like console log and I'm going to interpolate something like hi my name is and I'm going to interpolate uh, my name. How do I get my name? Well I've got a reference to the user so I could say something like user dot name. Okay sounds good. So I've got a user at first, I created a user with no methods attached. And then on a second moment, for some reason, I wanted to add a new functionality to the user. This is one of the beauties of JavaScript because everything is dynamic. If you have an object, even if it's a constant, you can still change it and you can add properties, remove properties, change properties, even if it's a constant because user is not the object user is a reference to the object. Uh, the reference is immutable, which means that I cannot say user is something else. This is not going to work because the reference is a constant. A va the variable is constant and you cannot assign anything to that, uh, anything else to that object. But you can change the properties. So for example, you can say, let's say Angelo user.name is Angelo, you can change the properties inside of the object. But it's not what I'm going to do right now. I'm writing this code just as a rehearsal of how ob objects work, okay? Let's stick with the, with the method. Const user is an object with name Anthony, age 13. Uh, 13? Well, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> user, <laughs> which is age 38. And then you've got user.speak, speak, which is a function doing this thing here, console log, hi, my name is user.name. Let's try this uh, code on the terminal on Node.js and I'm going to do node01 methods. And it doesn't do anything. Why is that? Well, because I defined the user, I defined its method and I'm not doing anything with that method. I have to invoke this method. So let's also do user, hey, speak. And now, probably, something will happen. Yes, hi, my name is Anthony. Nice. Okay, and uh, what if I want to do the usual magic trick in which instead of declaring an anonymous function and just attaching to this user, um, I want to uh, create a function declaration and then give a reference of to that function as the speak property of the user. So I'm going to cut this fun anonymous function here. I'm cutting it with control X, command X on Mac, and I'm pasting it with control V, command V on Mac, and giving it a name, a name that can be anything actually. I'm going to say speak, but it's it can be really any name. And as user.speak, we can now replace the anonymous function with the reference to that function, speak, like this. 
This is nothing new. We already done multiple times this kind of switcheroo uh, from function expression to function declaration. We need to, to, to be careful though that here we have to only pass the reference to the function and not invoke it because otherwise user.speak will have a value which is whatever is returned from the invocation of this function. And we don't want this. We just want to attach a reference to a function. So whenever we want to invoke this function, it will actually execute. Okay, so remember one of the hardest things in JavaScript is understanding why and when you should add the parentheses or not. But by now you should have understood it if you still have problems. Don't worry, we can still rehearse it uh, on Wednesdays or any time you want on Discord. And now if I do node one methods, nothing changed because I just refactored my code by extrapolating this function expression into its own function declaration. Why do I need to do that? Well, because now this function can be attached to more than one object. For example, if I now create another object here, um, const user is, okay, I will put the name and age, uh, sorry, not, not user, it, it must be some other variable. Um, I will put the properties of my dog. My dog has a name, Aria, just like Arya Stark, but it was not from Game of Thrones. It was, it's just a coincidence. And her age is... Oh, I don't remember if she's five or six years old. I think she's six. Six years old. Let's say six. Don't really remember. Anyway, um, then we can attach the same property to the dog. And we can do it in a couple of ways. Either we do it just like we did with the user. So we can say, hey, dog.speak is equal to speak. So user.speak and dog.speak are properties of two different objects which reference to the same function, the function speak that we define here below. But I'm not forced to attach a function only after I declare the object. If I want to, I can just say here, the property speak is a reference to the function speak. So this thing here is redundant now. I can declare the speak property right when I'm declaring the, the object. So you see how dynamic JavaScript is. I can declare an object, filling it all its properties if I know them uh, in, in advance, or I can add and change and delete those properties later on. Watch out because there's a difference in the syntax. For example, when I put properties inside of the declaration of the dog, uh, these properties are separated. The key and value are separated by uh, a column. But when I instead assign things later on, I have to use the equal symbol because this is an assignment, okay? So I declare a dog as a key value pair, key column value pair. And if I need to do something else more, after the declaration of the object, I use dot notation and the assignment operator. Should be pretty straightforward. The problem here is that if I ask the dog to speak, uh, probably it won't tell me exactly what I want. In fact, I'm going to clear the node terminal and execute again the script. And both the user and the dog says, say, hi, my name is Anthony, but my dog is not Anthony. My dog is Aria. So there's a problem with this code. What is the problem? Well, the problem is that if you see the function speak, speak is referring to the name of the user, not of the dog. And this is a problem. I want to speak as myself. If I attach this function to any object, I want that object to provide its own name, not just the name of the user. I want the name of my dog here. And this is where this, the keyword, this 
comes into place. The this keyword that you can just replace here means whatever this function is attached to will be the subject that will execute this function. So this dot name when attached to the user will get the name of the user and this dot name when attached to the dog will get the dog's name. And that's it. Really, really straightforward if you think about it. Let's see if this works. Yes, hi, my name is Anthony. And in the case of the dog, hi, my name is Aria. So what is so difficult about this? Well, you tell me, is it difficult? Or am I going too fast? Probably yes. And if so, I'm going to slow down and give you some time. Let's see what you say. So it takes every object in the JavaScript file. Um, yes, yes, you can say it's like this for now. Yes, this dot name is whatever this function is attached to. So in this case, we have two, two objects and we attach the same function to both objects in two different ways. And this will refer to the, the user or the dog. If I create another object or if I create anything else, and attach this function, well, the function will be attached to that thing. And if I instead, uh, that's, that's actually a good question. What happens if I just invoke the function like this? Let's find out. I'm invoking the function and the function is not attached to anything. So what, what does this mean in this case? Hi, my name is undefined. <laughs> okay. Apparently this in this case, since the function is not attached to any object, is undefined. Because, well, in the file, there's nothing that is invoking this function, just the file itself. Isn't that too broad and maybe dangerous if it automatically applies to all objects? Okay, wait a second. It doesn't apply to all objects. It's a, it applies to the object to which you are attaching the function. Only that. In fact, if I invoke the function with no objects, uh, this is not attached to anything. And in fact, it's undefined. If I attach speak to the user, then this will be the user invoking that function. And the same goes with the dog. So this can be attached to anything, but it doesn't mean that it's, uh, it is attached to everything at the same time, right? It, it can be attached to anything, uh, as soon as you attach it to something, it will, it will hold a value, a value of the object that it's invoking that function. But currently, this is not referring to every single object in the file at the same time. Just the object that it's invoking the function. And in this case, there's not even an object. So speak is actually giving me undefined because there's no object there. Well, actually, there is an object. In fact, if there was no object, this would be undefined and it would break. So there is an object here called this, which has a name that is undefined. So now the question is, who is this? Let's find out. Console log this. Um, I'm going to execute again, maybe clear first. Ooh. I see that the first object that invokes this function, well, the object that you see here, when it invokes the function, well, unsurprisingly enough, uh, the object is that object which has a name of Anthony H38 and speak is a reference to the function speak. In the second case, the object is my dog. Yes, it's the dog which invokes speak. So the object, this in this case, is the object name aria age six and speak the same reference to the same function speak but then when i invoke the speak function without attaching it to any object well there is an object look how big it is ref one object global global clear interval clear timeout set interval set timeout q micro task what is this thing well this is a global object that is automatically provided by uh, by node.js and it has this shape because we are running this code in Node.js. If I run this code on the browser, it's going to behave differently. 
let's see. I'm going to copy all this code. I'm going to open the developer tools as always. Wait a sec. Why, how you should not write JavaScript? Okay. <laughs> Devto is catching my eye sometimes. Um, okay, same code. I have a user. I attach speak, the speak function defined here uh, as uh, a method of the user. And I ask the user to speak. I have a dog. I ask the dog to speak because I attach the speak function in a different way, but it's a similar way. And then I also invoke speak as it is without attaching it to any object. We should find three outputs and let's see what these outputs are. Okay, so the first one is console logging this, which is the current object whose name is Anthony. The second one is console logging the object, my dog, and hi, my name is Aria. And the third object is the window. And it's a huge object, really, really huge. We probably already saw this object. In fact, maybe I showed you once when uh, just writing window on the terminal, something like this, window. And as you can see, here the, uh, the string is slightly different. It's not, hi, my name is undefined. It's, hi, my name is empty string. Because the window has a property called name, and it's an empty string, as you can see here. So, the problem with the, this keyword is that you never know what this refers to. And I wanted to summarize this problem in this beautiful tweet that I found. JavaScript makes me want to flip the table and say, mm, if, mm, but I can never be sure what this refers to. Yes, this is the problem that we have with JavaScript, but it's because it's misunderstood. In other languages, this, the, this keyword has a very strict meaning. It means this instance of this class. But we don't know what a class is right now. We don't know what is an instance. And uh, there, is, there is a new concept in JavaScript, which is classes and instances, and we are going to see it very rapidly. I don't think it's really that important for, for, the, for the program that I want to follow, but uh, we will surely mention it because, well, it's important. Um, but here, as you can see in JavaScript, the concept of this is lessened a little bit. It's not just this uh, instance of this class. It's just whoever is invoking this function. And this is what makes JavaScript difficult for, some, for people that come from other languages. In fact, sometimes you do something like, uh, uh, you remember when we created a, a button and we said button dot on click and we attached a function. Well, when we do something like this uh, and we do console log this, uh, I'm pretty sure that this, in this case, will be the button that is actually invoking the onClick method. Okay? Uh, but then you have this function attached to something else, for example, a text input. Well, this will refer to that text input which is confusing for people coming from other languages. But since uh, some of you, or maybe even most of you, don't come from other languages, but uh, have this as their first language, this should not be confusing, right? It's just a convenient thing, because this is so broad as a term, you can use it however you want, if you can tame it, okay? And I think that's it for the this keyword. I don't think there's uh, too much to say. Let's see. Um, yeah, when we deal with the objects, you can start talking about object-oriented programming. And even when you start doing object-oriented programming, they all even mention something like the famous book by the Gang of Four, Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, which is a very good and important book that I read multiple times. I'm still reading it from time to time. Um, and it's also probably, um, you know, uh, it's, it's like a, a warning bell 
of the fact that when you do object-oriented programming, you're going to deal with very complex things. And uh, I was a fan of object-oriented programming until I rediscovered the functional aspects of JavaScript, especially when using uh, frameworks like React, Redux from Facebook. And now I have a little grudge towards orient, orient, uh, object-oriented programming. I think it's too complex. We are trying to solve complex problems with simple solutions. And instead, object-oriented programming, in my experience, is uh, I now feel that it solves complex problems with complex solutions. Um, one uh, meme about this is... Let's see if I found it, if I find it. Yep. For those of you who know about design patterns and object-oriented programming, look at this meme. I had a problem, so I thought to use Java, not JavaScript. Now I have a problem factory. This could probably be not, uh, this could, joke could go over your head if you don't know what, an, of what a factory object is, but that's no problem. Um, the gist of this is that with object-oriented programming, sometimes you overcomplicate your, uh, your solution. Because object-oriented programming is like this. Well, functional programming usually makes things much, much simpler. Um, let's go on. But anyway, I still teach object-oriented programming. I still teach Java from time to time. And uh, it's fine. It's one paradigm. You have programming languages which allow you to program in different paradigms. For example, Java is object-oriented. We could even say class-oriented, and you will see what a class is when we start dealing with classes. JavaScript allows you to do object-oriented or also cl or class-oriented or even functional programming or whatever. There are other languages such as, for example, Prolog, which allow just for logical programming. It's a completely different way of programming. Um, it's a very declarative way of programming. And there's other languages such as, I think, OCaml, for example, which is highly functional. But I think that OCaml, since it has an O in the, in the name, probably also has some object-oriented features. Yes, just like I see here, OCaml, is a general-purpose multi-paradigm programming language which extends the camel dialect of ML with object-oriented features. So every kind of language out there starts with being an object-oriented programming language or a functional programming language, and then it gets extended by adding features from the other paradigm. So you are free to use that language any way you want. JavaScript started as an object-oriented programming language because objects were there from the start. It was not a class-oriented programming languages because the concept of class was not there at first, but then they introduced it. And it has always been a functional programming language, and now it is even more functional than, uh, than in early days because we have new constructs that allow you to, to, to do some more functional programming. And we will see some little things about functional programming. In fact, if you saw the slides here, we've got this one here. This slide says JS functional. So I had in mind to do something about functional programming. And in the slide called inheritance, we're going to look also at object-oriented programming and classes. Okay, so we're going to cover everything. Don't worry. Method shorthand. Yeah, I love this thing. Uh, so whenever you, you want to declare a method inside of the function. So for example, let's, let's attach a method to the user and I want to add it directly to the user. I can say something like, I don't know, walk. Walk is a reference to an anonymous function, so function expression. And in this function, I will do, I don't know, console log. Oops, not this one, console log uh, left foot, right foot. I'm really, really running out of ideas here. Um, okay, so here we are declaring a method as a property called walk inside of the object user. And 
it's just a function expression. Well, with objects, you have another way to declare these methods. And this way is removing the function keyword and even the column. So you just come up with this, which is very, very similar to the methods that are described in other languages, such as Java, C Sharp, or whatever. Methods in an object are usually uh, declared like this. You don't say function, you don't specify this keyword, never. You just say walk, open parentheses, and in bracket, in curly braces, you, you just put whatever you, you need to put. That's it. And here, again, you have a reference to this if you really want to. Of course, if you declare walk like this, this walk method belongs only to the user. The dog doesn't have a walk method because I'm not sharing this function. The beauty of JavaScript is that sometimes, if you want to, you can create a function and have this function borrowed to other objects. So it's very, very powerful. In other languages, you cannot do such a thing. You can just declare a method inside of an object and that's it. That method only belongs to that object and you cannot borrow that method to anybody else. So far, so good. Okay, this in methods, I already told you. So if I say hi, alert this dot name is the current object. I could use user dot name, but in this case, it just works for this user. What happens if I want instead to uh, create a reference to something else? For example, in this case, they show you that there is a user with a method say hi that alerts user dot name. And then you create a variable called admin which is a reference to the same object, and then you destroy the first reference to the object. So now there is just one reference to the object, and it's called admin, not user anymore. And here it's going to break, because you lost the connection to the user object. This will not uh, break if instead of user you just use this. Whatever this object is invoking this function, I'm just going to use this as the object. It's really difficult to, to explain this stuff because, well, I have to say this in multiple, uh, in, in different uh, exceptions. Uh, this is not bound, as we saw, so you can create a function say hi, and then you can attach, attach say hi to different objects, for example, user and admin, and every one of these objects will tell you something else. For example, the user will say John and the admin will say admin because they have two different names. Uh, you can invoke the function, the method, as we saw before, or if you want to be fancy, you can even invoke the function with the square bracket notation, which usually is not that important, but sometimes I use this thing, and uh, I'm probably going to tell you something strange for you, but sometimes I want to, for example, I have an object called, uh, let's say, database, and the... D don't write this thing with me, don't worry. Uh, we will do something similar. Uh, the database is able to create some data, okay, and we have a method that does blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is more uh, pseudocode. This is not real code. And then the database also has another method called update, given the data. Okay, sometimes I want to model the fact that if I want to save the data, if the data is some new data, it should be created on the database, so it should be stored for the first time. And if the data is not new, but I'm just changing it, then I want to invoke the update data, uh, the update uh, method on this data, okay? Uh, this is what is usually called an uh, upsert. An upsert means update or insert. Uh, I insert a new, new data if it wasn't there already, and I update this data if it was already there. And uh, an upsert could be created, for example, in a database uh, in this way. We can say, hey, database, do not just create the data, do not just update the data, but you can do whatever you want to do. Const operation is if the data, for example, I don't know, is new, then use create. Otherwise, do update. 
And in this case, you can uh, ask the database to perform the operation, whatever it is. So as you can see, I'm combining the fact of uh, retrieving a generic property from an object, given some variable that was calculated elsewhere. But the property can be a function, can be a method. And once I get this property, I can invoke it with parentheses and even optional parameters. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to remove this, but it's just one small example on why bracket notation could be useful uh, even for methods, not only for, um, not only for pro properties that are values and not functions, okay? Hope it makes a little bit of sense, at least for, uh, at least, I don't know, uh, intuitively, blah, blah, blah here too. Okay, this is not going to work on your code. You see, there's a, lots of errors. It's just pseudocode to show you what I mean. Okay, if I call with an object, this will be undefined. No, it's not true. Not always. In fact, we saw that if we invoke a function bound somehow to this, and we invoke it on Node.js, this is not undefined. This is some global object that is provided automatically by Node.js. And if you do this exact same thing on the browser, yep, this will refer to the window, to the browser window, which has lots of properties and methods. Um, the cons, well, okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now we can go back to arrow functions and finally understand what is the extra uh, perk of using arrow functions. So let's say that uh, I have to get rid of this part, so I'm going to just comment it out. Okay, I have this function speak and I'm invoking this function without uh, a context, without this. But can I say just invoke this function even if it doesn't belong to anyone and I want this this keyword to be related to my dog. So I don't want this method to be to belong to the dog. This is not going to uh, to happen anymore now. I want to invoke this function and even if this func function doesn't belong to the dog, I want to invoke this function and bind it to my dog. So this will still be my dog. Well, there is a new um there is a new construct in JavaScript, uh, which is not really that used. In fact, I'm going to show it right now and then we can just uh, get rid of it. And it's like this. If you have a function like speak, you can bind this function to an object. So this, this keyword, will actually refer to that object that I bound the function to. Uh, how do you bind this function? Well, functions are strange creatures in JavaScript. In fact, a function, as you already know, is a block of code that you can just uh, declare in multiple ways and then invoke. But as a, a function sometimes even behaves like an object. In fact, for example, I can say, hey, speak, as if you were an object do something for me. What is your length? What is your name? The function itself behaves sometimes like an object and it has properties, it has methods. So, just to think, I went back to read the description of the stream today and now it makes sense. I'll show you this but not that. It was a good one. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'll try to crack jokes as, as much as possible. <laughs> Okay, so speak.name is a property of the function speak because the function speak is a special kind of object actually and it's able to be invoked itself but it also has multiple properties and uh, one property is the, na is the name so in fact if I console log speak.name we can see it here what happens did I refresh everything uh, do I have here everything speak.name Yep, it works. So the, the name of the function is speak and I can uh, inspect this property of the function. What does uh, what else does the speak function has? Length, zero. 
Okay, I don't know what this length is. Actually, I know, but I'm not going to tell you right now. Um, and then we have other, other things. We also have a toString method, which is just a string representation of, its, of the same function. And we have this other special function called bind. When I say speak dot bind to the dog, it means that the dog, oops, uh, the dog doesn't have any reference to speak, but I can invoke this function speak as if belonged to the dog. So the, the speak function doesn't really belong to the dog, but it will be invoked bound to the dog. And this just makes it so that this here is the dog itself. Let's see if it works. Uh, yeah, there is also the my name is undefined. There's too much stuff going on here. So let's, um, let's, for example, remove this one. I don't think it worked, actually. Speak, bind to the dog. Oh, okay, I know why. Speak.bindDog doesn't change the original function. Speak.bindDog creates a new function that is bound to the dog. And I have to store this function somehow. So, for example, const speak as dog. This is a reference to a new function that is not the original speak function. It's the new function that binds the speak function to the dog. And if I invoke now speak as a dog, then now I should see something different. Yep. Apparently, the speak function, even though if it was not really attached to the dog, the dog still doesn't have the function in, inside of it. You see, the object itself has just name and age, and it doesn't have the function. But I was able to borrow this function and use it as if it was belonging to the dog. Pretty strange, but sometimes it's pretty useful. Uh, but we usually don't use it like this. So don't worry, you don't have to learn by heart this bind method. Bind was a function that didn't exist in JavaScript, so we had to use other libraries that allowed you to add this thing. Uh, but nowadays we don't need the libraries anymore because it's part of the language. And also, we've got another in cool thing. And the cool thing is this, is that Whenever you use an arrow function, like const, let's say again, speak, oops, arrow function, and here, blah, blah, blah. Well, this function is automatically bound to the outside context. So, to make it more clear, if I have a function like this one, I can do a console log of speak here, like this. I, I, I can say I can do a console log of this. It's really difficult to do this kind of lesson with this and that. Uh, I can do a console log of this and it will show me one thing. But if I invoke the function speak, this, this could be different from this, this. Let's say the inner this that I find in the function could be different from the outer this that I found outside of the function. Why is that? Well, because, for example, I could attach the speak function to the user, and as we saw, this would refer to the user inside of the function. But this, this, will not refer to the user outside of the function. Okay? I hope it makes sense, even if I'm saying this, this too many times. It reminds me a little bit of uh, that uh, old lady, which was called Tu Yu Yu. Oh, Tu Tu Yu Yu. There was a meme about this person. It's a it's an important person. I I think she be, should be famous for her scientific achievements. But then she just became very, very, very famous, more famous because of this. Must be a nightmare to sing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday to, to you, you, you. Okay, and, and this is exactly the same case. It's difficult, but please, please bear with me because uh, we will make it, we will sort it out. So the, this keyword inside of a function 
could mean multiple things. It depends on what object is this function attached to or bound to, if we want to. Uh, the um, arrow function makes it possible that the this that you have outside of the function will always be exactly as the this that you find inside of the function. So speak with an arrow function is a function that is automatically bound to the external this. And since Sao mentioned the fact that I'm going to explain you this and not that, um, no, you know what? I'm going to explain you also that. In fact, there is another stupid way to ensure this bounding, this bounding. And this method is usually creating a variable that is usually called self, or sometimes it's called that. And this variable is referring to this. So if you do console log of that, it shows you exactly the same as this. But then you can use that in here. And when you use that, you are pretty sure that the value of this that is equal to the outer this because it's, your, it's referring to the same variable. This is an old way to ensure that a function is bound to the this that you want to, which is usually the external uh, this, not the internal this that we have in the function. This is the old way. You use a variable called that or self. Then someone found out that this is not a good way. Why is it not a good way? Because the function depends on some external variable and thus this function is not really that predictable. As I already told you, it is much, much better to have a function always dependent on its input parameters and not on some uh, external variable. Maybe I could remove this variable one day and this function will break. Or I could change what this variable is attached to. For example, that is uh, one as a string and this function will still break. Okay, so this is not a good way to ensure that a function is bound to the this that you want to. So that is the reason why I won't suggest you to, uh, I don't recommend you to use the that or self keyword, uh, a variable name. Um, in uh, early days, we had libraries such as jQuery. I think that jQuery has some function called bind. Yeah. Well, this is bind an event type. So I'm not even really sure that it's this one. Or maybe in jQuery it's called proxy. Yeah, it was something like proxy. Uh, jQuery is a very old library, which probably shouldn't be used anymore. But it's still widely used anymore, <laughs> a, a, a lot. And um, jQuery is some sort of object, as you can see, jQuery, that has a method called proxy in which you pass a function, you pass a context, which can be an object, and this will create a new function that binds the function to that context, ensuring that the this that you find inside of the function is referring to this context, okay? Uh, this was jQuery. Then we had other libraries. I already mentioned Lodash multiple times. Lodash is still a relevant library nowadays because it has multiple useful methods. And one of those methods is called bind. And it's probably not that important anymore because bind is now part of the JavaScript language. But it's exactly the same thing. You ask to the Lodash object to bind a function to the this argument, to the, to the context. And this will create a new function that binds this function to this context. And now you can do this either in, with, the, with the language itself without needing any, any library. So speak.bindDog is creating a new function that is bound to the dog. Or if you want to, you can just use an arrow function. And the arrow function will make sure that the outer this and the inner this are the same. 
It will not make sure that the inner this is dog if the outer this is not the dog. So watch out. I know it's uh, it's a little confusing, but don't worry because it's not really that difficult. You just have to keep it in mind. And as soon as you come up with uh, uh, with exercises or real life scenarios, you have to remember only the most important part, which is the this keyword inside of a function does not always refer to the outer this. If you want to make it um, related to the outer this, you have multiple ways. But nowadays, the best way is probably to use arrow functions. And when you're dealing with um, event handlers, like the button on click function, blah, 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 that maybe does a console log of this, if you really want to refer to the button here and you are afraid of this this keyword and i would probably agree with you that it, you have to be scared of the this keyword because it could change its value over time it could be referring to something strange and unusual well in this case when you have event handlers the attach function already provides to you uh, a parameter called event and you can ask the event.target, which is a reference to the button. So you don't even need most of the times to use the this keyword in your functions. You can always find a way to refer to what you want to refer without using the this keyword. Apart from when, of course, you are dealing with object-oriented programming and classes which we will probably do at a certain point. So don't worry, we will go back to the this keyword as soon as we deal with classes, okay? But for now, just know that this exists and this is not bound to the same thing always. It can be bound to some other things too. So that makes it really, really confusing. It's one of the JavaScript bosses that we have to defeat, okay? please read the reference material because maybe the reference material uh, explains things much better than me. They are using um, an example here that I don't really like that much because user is an object that has a method called say hi. And the method called say hi inside of the body declares an arrow function which uses this and invokes the arrow function this is a pretty convoluted example, but it shows how when you use an arrow function inside of the same object, the this keyword that you see here refers to the user and nothing else. Because the arrow function binds this keyword this to the user, to the outer context. Uh, and it does it automatically without needing you to, to specify it. Okay, it's pretty strange, but it, it's some, it's part of object-oriented programming, and that's it for the for object methods and this. Are you fine with that? Don't worry, we we will go back to it. Okay, so JavaScript is. A functional programming language and yes this is complicated yes Angelo <laughs> I know I know and um, don't worry about it though because it, it just feels more and more natural the more you practice with it uh, right now I just showed you some examples and the examples are probably too abstract uh, I'm trying to provide some more concrete examples but it's very hard to provide you concrete examples if I haven't shown you anything about event handlers or something like that. Or these things are really useful when you when you deal with uh, some frameworks, for example, in AngularJS or in React or in Vue.js, you see these things in action. But um, it, there's no use to explain you React right now because there's so many other things that you still don't know. Uh, and so it's better to leave them for now for a second moment. 
So JavaScript is a functional programming language and it's also an object-oriented programming language. And some people say that JavaScript is more object-oriented than Java or C Sharp. Because Java and C Sharp use a concept called class, a class. And JavaScript is object-oriented, has always been object-oriented, without the need of classes. Classes were introduced only recently because people wanted to feel at ease uh, with the language. So they introduced this concept of classes, which were, was completely optional, and now it's part of the language. But before classes, we had another way to create objects. Well, the first way to create objects was this. You cannot do such a thing in Java, or at least with the older versions of Java. Now Java is trying to catch up with all the other languages, so probably it already has some constructs, very convoluted constructs that allow you to create an object uh, in a simple way, just like with an object literal. But for many years, Java did not have a way to express objects in such a simple way. You had to instantiate an object that belongs to a class. And uh, in JavaScript, you can create an object with an object literal, or you can use a constructor function. So I'm going to use this. Um, am I speaking about inheritance? No, it's the new, how's it called? New? Operator new, constructor new. Okay, rename, uh, constructor new. Okay, this is not really that difficult, I think, to, to understand. If you want to create an object called user, for example, you can do let user is equal to name Anthony age 38. But if you want to create multiple users of that same kind, well, you can use a function. And we already done it uh, one time. We said something like function create user given two parameters, for example, the name and the age. And this function will create an object, maybe called user. So let user is equal to, and we're going to attach these properties that we find as per input parameters. So name is name and age is age. Or, as you already know, there's a shorthand for this because if the name of the key is equal to the name of the value, you can just call it like this. Shorthand. Which is something that we could even do in the previous example. In fact, uh, at a certain point I showed you something like, okay, the dog does speak, speak. But if you want to, this can become just speak. That's it. Very nice, very clean. Anyway, uh, in this function, we take name and age as input parameters and we create an object, we construct the object as we want, and then we return the object. We can uh, then create multiple objects of the same kind. So I can console log create user. And you know, I'm going to mention do you know Java, says Kremlin King 1313? Yes, I was born with Java. I studied Java as my first language at university. And I was a fan of Java for multiple years until I got to know JavaScript in 2012. And I slowly became, I slowly grew fond of uh, JavaScript uh, more than Java. But I still... Uh, teach Java. I don't use Java in my daily job because I usually prefer to use other languages such as JavaScript. Do you know Android programming? Yes, I know some Android programming and uh, I would recommend you to not use Java for Android programming. Uh, probably you know Kotlin. Uh, if you don't know Kotlin, look at Kotlin. It's probably a better solution, a better language for Android programming if you want to do native Android programming. So, create user. I can uh, go with um, creating multiple users. For example, how can I reach two layouts from one Java file? Sorry, I cannot help you right now. I'm in the middle of a lesson about JavaScript. And uh, it's a good question. So, if you want, you can reach out on Discord. We have a Discord server. 
Oop, not server boost. <laughs> we have a Discord server. If you're not there already, I can invite you right now. And uh, we can discuss about this. We can help each other in the Discord channel. Uh, no limits. I will try as much as I can to help you uh, when the lesson is over. Okay? So, with this function, as you can see, given any name and any age, I can create any kind of user with that name and age and return it. So I can, for example, now create multiple users. I can create Angelo, but I, unfortunately I don't remember your ages and uh, it's probably not even that important. I think that Angelo is uh, slightly older than me. Don't remember. I'll give you... I'll say you're very young, you're 18. <laughs> Uh, then we've got uh, Sao and Tiago, for example. Console log, create user. You're 28. You are younger than me. Oh, okay. So I was wrong by just a little bit. Okay. Um, then we are going to put Sao, which of course she's a lady, so she must be really young. And uh, console log, Tiago. Um, Let's put Tiago here. And Tiago, I know that they studied chemical engineering together, so I would say that they have the same age. And since Sao is 18, Tiago is 18. <laughs> okay, random numbers, because I don't want to uh, invade your privacy. Uh, now, if I try to uh, execute this code, uh, the user is uh, completely useless now, right now. I'm going to use this function to create multiple users. And so I'm doing node 02 construct a new. And as you can see, I've got one function that made the construction of 27, almost 28. Oh, so you're almost uh, the same age, guys. And I think that Tiago is the same age too. Okay, younglings. As you can see, one function to rule them all. One function allows me to create multiple objects of the same kind. And in fact, sometimes we call these kinds of functions a factory function. You remember the meme that I showed you before? I had a problem, now I have a problem factory. This is not completely related to that factory concept there, but it's similar because a factory in software engineering is usually something, a function or an object or whatever, that is able to build other things. It, we are slightly complicating things, but it's not that really that complicated. In JavaScript, this is not really, really that important. I'm just going to give you this information for culture. But in JavaScript, there is a special kind of function that has always been available. And this kind of function is instead called a constructor function. Constructor function. Which behaves exactly the... Well, constructor. Constructor function. Nope. Constructor function. And this function behaves exactly the same as a factory function, but it has a slightly different syntax. The function is usually called like this. Function. The name is not the usual function name, which is a verb in the imperative form. It is usually the name of the object that I want to construct in Pascal case. So, for example, if I want to create users, this function will be called user with a capital U, given the name and the age. The body of this function can be exactly the same. And the way you use this function is always, if you want to, exactly the same. In fact, I can change every occurrence of create user with user and it behaves exactly the same. Let me check. Uh, open integrated terminal. Yeah, still working the same. I just gave the function a different name so far, right? In five years, JavaScript will be Java, says skills null. Um, I agree. 
I think that JavaScript will be more and more similar to Java and Java will be more and more similar to JavaScript. In fact, Java started adding some concepts that are borrowed from other languages uh, which belong to functional programming. And I would also say that in five years you will be able to choose which language you want to use to build web applications. It will not just be just JavaScript. We already have some attempts based on uh, WebAssembly of uh, writing code in, for example, C Sharp that runs on the browser. So it will be nuts. And I'm not really that uh, a fan of JavaScript. Uh, I'm not a fanboy of JavaScript. I'm a fanboy of uh, a language that works and that helps me. And one day, if there will be a language that, uh, that, that rules them all, I will use that. But I'm pretty sure that we'll never have one common language which is uh, suitable for every purpose. There is still a need for assembly, there is still a need for C, there's still a need for, for Rust, for JavaScript, for Java, in different scenarios different per, for different purposes so yes yes probably some languages will converge but i think that also languages will still be kept a little separated typescript is a huge attempt to make javascript sim more similar to java because it adds things that javascript doesn't want to add right now which is static typing interfaces generics etc etc and i myself feel comfortable without static typing, interfaces, generics, etc. But other people don't. So maybe one day JavaScript will have those features as part of the language. And then it will be very difficult to tell if we are programming in JavaScript or in Java. Anyway, this constructor function, why should I write this constructor function like this? Well, because the constructor function allows me to invoke the function by adding a new keyword which is new and this keyword doesn't do anything actually but uh, it allows me to make a distinction in syntax between a generic function even if it was a factory function and instead a constructor function when i want to build a user i can do it like this const my uh, const admin is equal to create user given the name and the age uh, let's say given Anthony and uh, 38 okay you can create a user by invoking a function or with constructive functions you can create the same admin by saying hey the admin is a new object of type user given the name and the age the difference is really, really subtle, and it, it's a little more than that, and I'm going to show you. But for now, let's keep it like this. Um, we can even probably inspect what happens if we use those two functions uh, on the developer tools in Chrome. Let's see what happens. I'm going to copy create user and its invocation, and I'm going to inspect what this, uh, what this thing is about. So, function create user given the name and the age, and then const admin is equal to create user Anthony38. Now, I should see an admin, and the admin is just an object, a plain object like this. Nothing really that useful, <laughs> and nothing new. With user, let's see the constructor function. I have to refresh the browser in order to wipe out every any function any variable that I created so far uh, right now what is an admin okay same thing but it is a little more explicit what I'm doing here I am creating a new object of type user let's say but that's not all the only thing that a constructor function can say in fact the constructor function is actually using the keyword this it has a reference to this and it can return this at the end assigning to our value says ooh, 
This is pretty, pretty new to me. Uh, so the user, the constructor function, has a reference to this, and I can attach things to this. It's, it's like it says, uh, I'm going to create a, a variable called this, and I'm going to attach properties to this variable, like uh, this age, and then I'm going to return this. As you can see, this code is actually not working because I shouldn't declare a variable called this inside of a constructor function, but it's done internally by the by JavaScript, by the JavaScript interpreter. In fact, the constructor function can be even written at, like this. The constructor function just allows you to, to, to just type the middle part. You already give for granted that you have a this object inside of the constructor function. You attach things to this uh, constructor, to this, this object. So you attach properties uh, starting from with the parameters that you have. If you want to, you can also attach other things like speak. Okay, um, I'm going to create an arrow function. Console log. Hi, my name is... I'm going to use the... Uh, I'm going to, to, to take advantage of the console log. This name and then this, okay? I have this uh, arrow function right now, and this is automatically also returned at the end of this constructor function. So it is a little easier to write a constructor function rather than a factory function, because you don't have to declare an object and then return it. You just give for granted that this object will be constructed. You just attach whatever you want to attach, and then it will be automatically returned. So if I now use this constructor function created like this, let's see what happens. If I inspect what the admin is, ooh, it's a little different. It says that it's an object of type user. I see user here. It's slightly different from just a plain object. This is an object of type user. And as an object of type user, it has an age, it has a name, it has a speak function, and it behaves exactly the same. Uh, admin, speak. Hi, my name is Anthony. And it works exactly the same. But now it has an extra information. It is an object of type user. And it, this allows also for some other concepts like inheritance which we are not going to probably discuss right now. Constructor functions are not really that important nowadays. In fact, nowadays we are not using constructor functions anymore because JavaScript introduced the concept of classes if you really want to deal with object-oriented programming and so you will probably use classes. For example, if you write programs in Angular, the Google slash Microsoft framework, you will create classes, not constructor functions. If you write code in uh, Vue.js, another framework, you are going to use plain objects. And if you're using React, you could use classes, but the trend is now using just functions. Functions that look like this, because they are functions that have a capital letter, a capital initial letter, but in those functions, you're never going to use the keyword this. So they are actually just functions. So as you can see, there are multiple ways to use JavaScript and there are the three most important frameworks out there for building web applications uh, start with their own uh, preference. Angular with classes and object-oriented programming, Vue.js with plain, simple objects, React starts with functions. That's why you need to know everything because if you are a React developer, you can stick with just functions maybe. But if you want to know it all and you want to easily switch between frameworks, between technologies, it is much better that you know all these things. So let's remember that constructor functions exist and then let's not use them ever again. <laughs> okay? We don't care about those. New user Jack. Yay. Okay. 
Um, this is what... Oh, okay. The, the tutorial says uh, pretty much what I told you. Uh, a constructor function implicitly says that this is an empty object, so I can add properties to this, and then implicitly the object is returned. But the only thing that you need to care about when you create a constructor function is this part here, where you attach the properties, nothing else. Blah, 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 blah. We don't really, really care about all the things that we see in constructors because, as I told you, constructors are not really that important. I'm also probably going to skip this other part, optional chaining, because this is a new addition, as you can see, and uh, I still don't really know if I want to use it ex extensively in my code. I tried a couple of times and see how it behaves, but I don't really, really like it that much. What is the problem? The problem is that if you have an object, maybe an empty object like user, oh, wait a second, is there is a fast way to learn a framework? Uh, well, no, well, f fast or slow, it depends uh, a lot on, uh, on your skills and or your openness. I would say that if you watch these lessons and you practice a lot on these lessons you will have a very solid base ground ground base uh, on top of which you will easily learn a framework by yourselves by just uh, uh, by just looking at the official documentation all i get told is just use it y yes um, for example if you want to learn react you just go to the official documentation. There's a tutorial. I don't know if I agree with the tutorial because they add strange things. If I remember correctly, they start by creating a, a game. No, no, not anymore. So every framework, every technology usually has some documentation and a tutorial. You start with the tutorial. You you try to get accustomed to to the, to the language. And then you look at the documentation which usually starts back from scratch. So it starts with uh, getting started and you read, you read, you read, you see some code, you try to apply that code, you try to do the exercises on, you, you try to do exactly what they say and you should probably be able to, to, to understand it by yourself. If you prefer video courses, there's so many video courses out there. There's YouTube videos, but I also learned a lot of things on this other website called Egghead. Egghead.io has many free video courses organized in pills on uh, different topics, even JavaScript. So you can stop watching my streams and go with uh, self-learning about JavaScript. Some of these are paid courses. Maybe you've got some uh, free lessons and then to continue you have to pay. I'm doing all this for free instead, all of this. Okay, I just want to make sure if I'm not missing out on something that I'm not aware of. No, no, I don't think so. No worries. Okay, so as all optional chaining, uh, the problem that it addresses is that we could have an empty object, for example. I won't switch to egghead, never gonna give you up, Anthony. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And now we're never gonna give. Uh, ah, and now we're never gonna put you down. <laughs> okay, so if I have an empty object and I try to access a property that doesn't exist, for example, user.address.street, this is not just going to give me undefined. This is going to give me an error because from the user, I'm accessing a property which is undefined, address, and from the undefined property, I'm going to access a property called street, which will give me an error because the address was not there in the first place. I don't know if this makes sense to you, so let's do it live. Let user is an empty object. Cool. What if I do want a user.address? Was it address? Yep, user.address is undefined, no errors so far. I'm just referring to a property that does not exist. But if I do user.address.street, that's an error because I'm trying to get a property from an object, which is not an object, it's undefined, okay? So this is usually very stressful for programmers. This in Java is called a null pointer exception. Null pointer exception, as you could imagine, 
is some sort of an, uh, an error, an exception to the usual rule, in which you are pointing to a null reference. In Java, we have references, just like in JavaScript, but null pointer exception, as you can imagine, is exposing the concept of a pointer, which is usually something more, more of a C, C++, like uh, the multi-billion dollar mistake. Yes, we usually deal a lot with uh, null pointer exceptions in Java, and in JavaScript, you don't have null pointer exception, you have the uncaught type error, because you cannot read property, the street, uh, you cannot read a property called street in an undefined object. And you also have the stack trace, but we don't care about that. So blah, blah, or equal blah, blah, won't work either, I guess. I'm sorry, I had to remove links, so I cannot see your comment. But I think that you're referring to something like user dot, uh, I don't know, address is equal to something else, maybe user dot uh, street. Can you share this thing? That is funny because we can see it. You can? User dot address dot street is equal. Okay, you're saying user dot address dot street is equal to user dot address. Okay, yes, exactly. This is uh, still another problem because user dot address is undefined. And this is not going to break things. But you're trying to assign a value, which in this case is undefined, but it could also be any value, like a street. Okay? But you're trying to assign this property to a property that cannot exist because it belongs to an undefined uh, property. So, yeah, still a problem here. Uh, Skills Null says that it's funny because we can see it. Do, uh, do you... Can are you really able to see it? Ooh. What? Okay. There's something strange in this. I have to change a little bit the the, 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 the settings here. <laughs> okay. So, you know what? I'm probably going to um, restore link sharing again since we are dealing with code. Uh, because so far we didn't have we weren't interrupted anymore by spammers so I could probably restore the settings uh, during the coffee break in 40 minutes okay so yeah we've got this kind of error and if we don't care about this error maybe we want to say uh, wait a second okay uh, if I want to say hey if there is a user and there is an address then give me the street of the address. But if there's no user or if there's no address, just give me undefined. Well, there's this new operator that I'm not recommending you right now to use right away, but it's optional. It's a new addition. You can say user question mark dot address question mark dot street. This should not break. It's just telling if there is a user, then go forward. Otherwise, just return undefined. And if there is a user address, then go forward, otherwise just return undefined. And in this case, it gave me undefined because there was a user, but there was no address. So it stopped there without giving me an error. That's it. This is the optional chaining operator, which could make things a little complicated. If you don't use the optional chaining operator, you can still do, do something like this. You have an empty user object, you ask if there is a user address, then give me user address street. Otherwise, give me undefined. But this is pretty long. Or you can say, you can have even a longer thing, like if there is a user address, then if there is a user address street, then give me user address street name, otherwise give me null, otherwise give me null. As you can see, this ternary operator is pretty bad looking. You can even do this with uh, the AND operator if you want to check for uh, truthy or falsy values. So if the address is truthy and the address street is truthy, then give me the user address street name. And this is already better, but of course, uh, as an empty string is a falsy value. And if you want to return an empty string because you think it's a valid value, then this will not work for you. That's why we have an optional chaining. With optional chaining, you just say, if there is a user and if there is address, give me the street. Otherwise, just give me undefined in any step 
of this process in every any step of this chain and that's it i'm not going forward on this uh, it's probably not really that important you can use it also for methods who cares about that really I'm sorry, I'm unfamiliar with JavaScript. Was that a double ternary? Yes, yes. And then you can do it also with uh, other languages. Yes, it was a double ternary. It was pretty bad looking. Or is that just how it looks? No, no, it was, it was. Um, there is also another new uh, part of the language. It's the symbol type. And I'm not going to explain it to you uh, because in my daily experience, I never happen once to need a symbol. A symbol allows you to create uh, a variable, unchangeable, so a constant, that is unique throughout your whole application. And this usually is more important for people that create components that will be used by other people, but not application developers. Maybe one day you will need that. Maybe you will need a special keyword that must be only one in the whole application and you don't want people to mess around with that variable. But I don't really care about this. Uh, let's just skip symbol. It's optional. You can read it. You can do the exercises if there are exercises about this. No, not even. And there's no real need to know it right now. This is one of those advanced concepts that you can see for yourself. Or we can see it together after the Academy finished, of course. Uh, we can still keep in touch in the Discord server and, uh, you know, share our knowledge. Object to primitive conversion. Nope, still another thing that I don't care about. These are all very, very specific things that we don't really care about. Uh, you can transform an object into a primitive type or into a string or vice versa. We don't really care about that. So I'm just going to skip this part too. And that's it then for objects. Uh, we saw object literals, how you create simple objects. We understood how you do, you pass by reference rather than by value, which is an important concept that applies to every programming language out there. We saw how methods work, so functions attached to an object or even bound to an object, and the strange behavior of the this keyword. We saw a, a glimpse of how constructors work, and we also saw a little bit of optional chaining, but that's not really that important. Remember to always practice a lot, read all the reference material, do all the related tasks, if you want, you can go to Free Code Camp or any other online tutorials and do some more uh, exercises uh, related to objects. We already created a deep clone function together. It was not really that difficult if you understood how to iterate over an object key uh, an, uh, over the object keys. And for experts, create a memoized factorial function that uses an object as a cache. Ooh, yeah, this is a very it's probably difficult. It's probably very difficult. So please, please don't try to do this uh, exercise if you haven't mastered everything before. If you really want a tough challenge, and I'm talking especially to you, Bobby, I don't see you speaking right now. So you're probably um, AFK or you had some other issues. Um, you usually are here. Oh, I got it wrong. No, I am here. Oh, okay. Memoized. Okay. Uh, so if you want a tough challenge, create a memoized factorial function that uses an object as a cache. What is a memoized function? It's not memorized. Memoize. Memoization is a concept in functional programming that is usually uh, a way to store partial results of a very complex calculation. So every time you invoke the same function, you're not recalculating everything from scratch, but you are leveraging a cache. And an object can be used as a cache because it can store uh, some, uh, some already calculated values. You put them there and then you can uh, um, 
read those values from the object as a cache instead of uh, recalculating them every time. It's pretty tough. It, uh, it requires you to know a lot about how objects work, about how functions work. Uh, probably you will also need to create functions inside of other, other, of other functions, which is probably not that difficult because we already done it. This is a function and it contains a function. So not really that difficult as a concept in this case. This can have to do with optimization of recursion. Yes, yes, exactly. In fact, factorial function is usually a recursive function, a function that calls itself. And when you, when you invoke the factorial of 5, you know that you have to do 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Well, the 1 is probably not really that needed. And if you want to, to do the factorial of 6, you have to do factorial of 6, uh, uh, well, you have to do 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times d times 2 times 1. But you already calculated the factorial of 5, which was 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, etc, etc. So maybe if you, once you have invoked the factorial of 5, the factorial of 6 could be do 6 times whatever you already calculated for the factorial of 5, which could be a value that you already calculated and cached somewhere else. So yes, exactly. This can have to do with optimization of recursion because you're not doing all these all, all the calculations back again. You're doing it just once and then reuse the same value. Uh, but it's very very hard. So it's just for those people among the audience who uh, probably already know a few of the concepts are at ease with some of these concepts and want an extra challenge. Then we can move on to slide deck number 14, which is about data types. And we are going to run through some of these lessons very quickly because I don't really care too much. We're, just like with CSS, we're going to have a look at many things that you can do on primitive types. Uh, so some things that you can do on numbers, some things that you can do on strings. Some of these things, you have found them by yourselves. I saw you uh, recently. Uh, I saw in previous uh, lessons that you were already doing something like number dot to fixed or uh, I, I don't know, to string or something like that. So you found out these functions by yourselves. And so I'm not going to just run through all of them because it would be really, really boring. But in the data types lesson, we finally have the part about arrays, which is very important. And also some things about strings, which is quite important. So let's go with data types. Methods of primitives. And I want to show you the joke here. And this is Rolf, your anesthesiologist. Haha, <laughs> primitive methods for an anesthesiologist. Okay, uh, methods of primitives. So, what is a primitive? Anything that is not an object so far, or a function. Uh, so, a primitive is a string, it's a number, uh, it's a boolean. We also have null as a primitive, undefined as a primitive. We also have symbol, which we completely skipped. And there's also another kind of a primitive type, which is pretty new. It's called big int. And it's just an, uh, a number, an integer number, with more precision. You can create bigger numbers uh, with big int because computers are limited. They allow you to create numbers up to a certain limit because that limit is driven by the number of bits that the processor that you have is using. You have a 64-bit processor, you can create a binary representation of a number up to 64 bits. If you need an, a larger number, Usually you don't, but if you need a larger number, then you can use this big int, which overcomes the limitation of the processor somehow. But we don't care about big int or symbol. We just need to stick with the usual stuff. Um, those primitive types strange, uh, behave strangely because they can be used sometimes as uh, objects. For example, if you create a string, which is, an obj uh, which is a primitive type, you can then ask methods, you can invoke methods on that string, even if the string is a primitive type and not an object. So, and this happens in JavaScript only. Um, in Java, for example, the string is not a primitive type, it's actually an object. Well, int is a primitive type, 
and you cannot do anything on the int. You need an object called integer. So in Java, things get more complicated, and I think in C Sharp too. Uh, because you have primitive types and you also have objects, if you need just the number 2, you create a primitive type. But if you need the 2 to do something for you, then you have to not use a primitive type, use a complex object. In JavaScript, everything behaves the same. It's fine. So you can create a string like a let message is equal to hello world. And the message is a primitive type, but if you do, if you add a dot, you will have a lot of properties and a lot of methods that you can use on this message object. For example, we can see some of them. Message.length means how many characters does this string have. And in fact, if you try to count them, you will see that they should be 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, okay? Including spacing, spaces, including uh, special characters, including probably even new lines. Let's see what happens if I do like this. Yep, the new line character is 13, uh, is the th 13th character. And if you use strange characters such as emojis, you will probably find out that emojis occupy two characters. I'm not going to tell you why right now, but it's like this. Okay, so we have multiple, multiple methods, multiple properties that you can use. String dot to uppercase, we used this already when we wanted to shout the string, remember? So we can do it like here, message to uppercase will shout the string and also had add a new line because we asked for a new line um, numbers also have some methods for example if you create a number and you ask to fixed with a parameter of two it will truncate the number to the two two decimals the two most important decimals. I don't know how to, uh, how do you say it. Let num is equal to, let's say pi. Uh, and as you know, a good approximation that I really like about pi is 22 divided by 7. This is a very good approximation of pi. Num, nice. But if I say num to fixed given 2, I will have a string which says just 3.14. And this is very useful if you want to represent those kind of numbers on the screen, right? You don't want to show 3.14, 2857, etc. You can just say 3.14. So this is very useful to format your numbers to be shown to the user. And uh, yeah, we've also got some construct like number or boolean. We already saw these. We said that we can convert anything into a number by saying number of 12. And it's the same thing. As you can see, this function number has a capital letter. So this is not just a function. This is actually a constructor function. Uh, you can use it as a new number of 12 and it will create an object of type number. Or you can use it without the new and it will just do the conversion. So you can use these kind of functions in multiple fashions. Uh, but as I already told you, don't use constructor functions. Just don't. Don't worry about that. So now this tutorial is going really in detail on anything that you can do on data types. We will run through them very quickly. If you want to try some of them, uh, please ask me to stop there and try because maybe you didn't really understand one point. But I think that most of these things are really, really easy. They are not the for loop. They are not uh, declaring functions. They are not the this keyword, okay? So, for example, you want to declare 1 billion. You can do it pretty easily by adding a 1 followed by 9 zeros, which is sometimes difficult to write and especially difficult to read. There's a new addition in JavaScript which allows you to separate the quantities with these underscores. It doesn't change anything from a syntactic point of view, but it makes the number more readable. Never used it in my life. 
but if you like it, it's there. It's one of those syntactic sugars that we have in languages. Syntactic sugar just means that you could write things in the usual way, but to make things more readable, there is some uh, constructs in the syntax that sugarcoat your appeal. Okay? Um, there's also another kind of representation that is uh, uh, very used in science. Uh, you will find this in, uh, um, in cal scientific calculators. So, y, 1 e 9, 1 exponent 9. This means 1 to the power of... I'm, no, I'm not saying 1 to the power of 9, which is wrong. But it's uh, 1 to the power... I don't know how he called it. Uh, you have to put just 9 zeros. How do you call that? Please, chemical engineers, help me on this. Uh, the exponential notation is going to do something like, yeah, one times one followed by, okay, 10 to the 9, you say. Are you sure? 10 to the 9. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. Yes, you're correct. I'm sorry. Yes, this means 1 multiplied by 10 to the power of 9. And it's exactly the same thing. So that's why it's 1e9. One, 1 multiplied by 10 to the power of 9. And why, did I, why do I say 1? Because if I want to, I can create 3e9, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 9. Okay, so it, it must not be just one. It can be any number multiplied by 10 to the power of nine. Uh, so for example, here, 7.3, 10 to the power of nine. Okay, Angelo says 6.02 times 10 to the power, uh, 10 E23 is the only chemical constant I still remember, right? So Santiago, lol. What is that? The Avogadro constant? Is it called like that? Um, okay. Very well done, skills now. Thanks for, uh, for helping me out on this. Uh, I did university many years ago, and then programming didn't uh, allow me to continue rehearsing this stuff. So I'm a bit rusty on maths, and I was never really, really good at maths. So you can do 7.3e9 to say 7.3 billions, which is exactly the same as doing 7 followed by 300, 7 by 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, or you can use the underscores. Um, so we don't really care about this. Um, you can also use negative exponentials, so we, you will go to the decimals. And you can also use other bases. You have an awesome memory, Angelo. Good. I think so, yes, although no clue what it was, just remember the figure from school. Nice. Yeah, it, is it the Avo, Avogadro number? Avogadro constant, yes. Um, uh, we can see it here. 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23. Okay. Um, we can represent numbers in uh, different ways. I don't remember even if I showed you before, but if you uh, provide a number and then you complete it with x, Sorry. If you start with 0x and then you use um, numbers, uh, ciphers from 0 to f, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but in a hexadecimal you have 16 digits, so you can use a, b, c, d, e, f. So in that case, you can represent them as numbers natively in JavaScript like this. 0xff means 255 in decimal numbers. Why is that? Well, because if you try to do the math, you will see that uh, these 16 on, on... I don't know, if these 16... I don't know how to call them. I'm sorry. I'm really, really rust in math. And, and we don't even need to care about too much about it. If you need hexadecimal numbers, you can just use 0x and then whatever you want as hexadecimal. Binary is probably better. 0b 
and then numbers. If you put all these numbers in line, this is exactly 255. I'm more used to binary numbers than hexadecimal numbers. So, um, yeah, you know how it works. So you can do something like, uh, if you want the number 3, well, this is binary 1-1. One, one. Why is it 1-1? One, one? Because this is 1 plus 2 times a one. <laughs> this first one is one, but this one is two times one. As much as when you say 11, this is one plus 10 times one. Okay? In base 10, every number that you see other than the first one should be multiplied by a certain amount of 10 positionally. In binary, you do the same with the number 2 and in hexadecimal you do the same with the number 16 so now if I have 0x11 this is 17 because this should be something like 1 plus 16 times 1 which is 17 base 16 was never intended for humans to understand in the first place I completely agree with you we use still a lot of hexadecimal numbers in colors but we don't really care about what those numbers mean. Apart from when you go to a, a, site, a site called badass.io, I think, which allows you to... No, not, uh, not badass.io, sorry. Uh, badass CSS, let's see. There is this website, oh, badass with the FF, which allows you to choose the color just because the hexadecimal representation reminds you of some English word like boobs or Google, or la la la, or coffee. Pretty stupid, but if, you're, if you like nerdy things, then you can choose a color based on, on this kind of uh, pattern here. So this is the only reason why you really need hexadecimal numbers, so you can uh, write boobs on the calculator. Um, okay, so we can represent hexadecimal number, binary numbers, octal numbers, which I never used in my life. We can transform numbers into strings uh, in base 16. And the number 255 in base 16 will give you the string FF. And uh, in, number, in base 2, it will give you this series of 1s. We don't really care about that much, okay? Um, there, is also, there is also a way to put the numbers in any base up to 36, apparently. And if it's in base 36, it means that uh, after all the digits that we have, 0, 1, 2, 3, F, up to 9, it will use A, B, C, etc. up to Z, up to the letter Z. That's why the maximum is base 36, because you have 10 numbers for digits plus 26 characters in the alphabet. You put them together, you have the ability to add to, to, to have a base of 36. Um, you can round numbers, and you know how to round numbers, because you can use the math object, which has a lot of different methods. Floor, to squash any numbers to its uh, closest um, integer part. Seal, which squashes on the ceiling. <laughs> And round, which squashes to the real, to the to the nearest one. You can even truncate it, truncate a number, which apparently is not supported by Internet Explorer. I don't care. I don't want to support Internet Explorer. Um, we can do so many things. Um, so, oh, this is another thing really cool. Ah, uh, yeah, this is for historical reason. You know how to truncate a number to the two most uh, to the two closest digits so if you have 1.2345 you want to have 1.23 you know how to do it you can use number to fixed so let num is 0 0.12345 and then you say num to fixed 2 and it will give you 0 0.12 but if you want this thing to be a number well, then you have to convert it back to a number, and you know how to do it. You just wrap it into number. Or maybe if you want to be a smart ass, you can just add a plus in here, and JavaScript will do the conversion automatically. This is the usual trick that we saw so far. But to fixed is a recent addition in JavaScript, and before that, we had to do some mathematical 
calculations. We had to do something like this. We get the number, we multiply it by 100, we, uh, we, we, we put the floor, we, we, we calculate the floor of this number, and then we divide again in 100. So if you have a number such as 1.23456, we multiply it by 100, so this becomes 123. So we shift, right? We shift the numbers two places uh, on the left. Then with floor, we just have one, two, three. And then by dividing uh, by 100, we shift back again on the right and we just have one dot two, three. This was a clever way to uh, truncate a number into its uh, decimals, the number that you want. If you want two decimals, it's multiplied and divided by 100. If you want three decimals, you multiply and divide by 1000, etc, etc. But now we've got also another way, which is num2 fixed. And this give you, gives you a string, so remember to... Oh, wait a second, here it is. <laughs> remember that if you want a number, you still have to convert it back again to a number by wrapping it into the number function or adding the plus in front of it. And this will spare you the headache of remembering how to calculate this thing here. Uh, imprecise calculations, we already saw some quirks in the JavaScript language. If you want to create a huge number, too huge for the computer to comprehend, it will just default to infinity. Uh, and if you try to check what the value of 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is, it will not zero dot, it will not be 0 0.3. It will be 0 0.3004 because of rounding errors in the computers. Um, it's a rounding error that the computer never wanted to fix because it's not that important. Usually when you deal with uh, decimal quantities, you don't need an exact value. You just need a, a value that is as close as possible to the value that you want. If you want to deal with precise quantities, then, well, you have to, uh, to use something else. Maybe you need some uh, extra library that allows you to perform exact computations. Maybe you want to use big int if you're doing computations with big integers and you want to support integers that are much more than this. So there are ways, but usually you don't need them. I never needed to, uh, I never needed to use something that was exactly the sum of two decimal numbers. And this does not only relate to JavaScript. As I already told you before in previous lessons, this is a problem that every, almost every programming language has. It has it's, it's in PHP, it's in Java, in C, Perl, Ruby. Um, I don't know about Python. Does JS have, been, have an approximate function that lets you round that way? Um, you... I don't know. <laughs> yes, you can round it with uh, the math round. I don't know if this uh, answers your question, but if you do math round, uh, well, this is not actually what you want because this will, for example, give, take math.py and just round it to three, which is not what you want. But if you want to do zero, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 and you want this to be 0 0.3, you can do the trick that I showed so far, which is you take 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 and you place it in a variable maybe, and you ask this variable to to be rounded to its two, wait a second, uh, yeah, to its f first decimal part, and you add a plus in front of it, and now you've got it rounded. I don't know if this is good enough, but it's a way. Uh, I see that the tutorial doesn't mention Python, and this tickles my curiosity, so I'm going to open the terminal, I'm going to get into Python, and I will try to see what happens if I add 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. Oh, Python has the same problem. Okay, so as you can see, every programming language has this problem. The only programming languages that do not have this problem are math-oriented programming languages, such as, for example, I think Fortran or the MATLAB language. There are some languages that, are, that give you exactly the the value that you need. 
Oh, here it is. This was the answer to your question. So the sum is of 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 can be just truncated with this trick. Or you can do it this way, which as we already saw, it's really similar. Uh, you have to multiply by 10. You should probably also uh, math floor if you want and then divide by 10 again. Um, pretty strange. Oh, another funny thing is that if you try to alert this huge number, it will be rounded to its closest 10 to the power of something. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Now we've got is none, which we already saw. There's also another thing that I didn't recall. It's called is finite, which checks almost the opposite. Is finite, given the value, will try to uh, transform any value that you pass into a number so 15 will be actually transformed into the number 15 and it is a finite number a string is not a valid number so it will, it will give you false because trying to transform a string into a number uh, when it fails it will give you this value nan not a number and if you say is in, is finite given infinity well this will give you full because false because it, infinity is not finite okay so instead of saying is not none, now you can also use is finite probably. So check your code and change. I only asked because I saw it in Unity the other day and it seemed weird to me. Oh, okay. So Unity is usually programmed in C sharp, if I remember correctly, right? Well, the Unreal Engine is programmed usually in C++. And yes, C sharp suffers from the same problem. And it's usually not a real problem because that four uh, at the end of this huge line of digits doesn't count anything. It doesn't really create any bugs there. Okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. There was also parse int and parse float and we started using them at first. Alert is fine at math.py gave me true. Hmm, yeah. You're saying, uh, I'm going to not do alert, but are you ask, you're you asking for is finite math.py. I love how you, Angelo, try things by yourself and experiment with the code. Yes, math.py is finite. Why? Because if it's one of those irrational numbers that has an infinite number of digits after the, the, the dot, but it's a finite quantity. It's not an infinity. It's somewhere there on the numbers line so it is finite it just has an infinite number of digits uh, there are many definitions of infinity in maths uh, infinity is not even the biggest quantity you could have even different orders of infinity you could have infinity to the power of infinity which is even more astounding than just infinity but any number in the number line even if irrational like math.py is actually a finite number uh, many other math functions one which is really cool is the random so math.random will give you a random number between 0 and 1 so this is a very useful function if we want to roll a die. Uh, but a, a die usually has six faces or 20 faces if you're, uh, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. And so you don't need a number between zero and one. But it will be pretty useful to just multiply this thing by six, which will give you a number between zero and six excluded. And then you probably want to have, uh, oops, you probably want to add one to this because sometimes you get a number which is zero dot something like this one. So if you add one to this, you are definitely going to have all the numbers from one to six and seven is excluded. And then you can round everything like this. And this should give you any random number between 1 and 6. So, as you can see, math random is a bit limited because it allows you to just have one random number between 0 and 1. But once you change this number by multiplying values and adding values, it will give you the number of your 6 faces die or your 
20 faces die. This should give us also numbers uh, greater than uh, than six, like nine or twelve. Let's say if I can find, uh, let's see if I can f uh, have a critical hit. Nope. Come on, give me a twenty. Not giving me a twenty. I don't know if this is because I failed to create the correct expression. Oh, I got a twenty! Yay! So critical hit. Finally, the orc. The ogre is down. Okay, so as you can see, math random can be really, really useful, especially in video games, <laughs> uh, because sometimes you want to add some uh, random behavior in video games, right? Um, you also have other functions in math, other methods, for example, a uh, function that calculates the max value between the values that you provide, or the minimum value. We already saw the power, but we don't need this anymore because we have this new operator to asterisk asterisk 10 which gives you exactly the same results as math pow math pow of 210 okay and that's it for numbers and then after the coffee break we will see some more important and useful methods belonging to strings so as always five minutes of coffee break and then we'll get back to the lesson okay See you in five minutes. Bye.
later. Hey, okay, I messed up with the microphone, etc. A few moments later, I'm back. And uh, probably you're still having your coffee, but uh, I wanted to immediately start because there's um, a question by SkillsNull. Thanks for the question. What is the difference between let and var? And um, I'm going to rehearse it. We already said what it means, uh, what, what is the difference between let and var, but I think it's uh, pretty important to rehearse it. So let is the new way to declare variables. If I say let num is equal to two, it's just like declaring a simple variable. Num has a value of two, and num can be also replaced with any other variable, with any other value. There's also another keyword, which is const, which allows you to create constants. And we usually use um, uppercase letters for constants, but not always. So I can say const pi is equal to 20, 20, uh, 22 divided by seven. This is a constant and I cannot change its value anymore. Var is the old way to declare a variable and uh, it's a strange kind of variable because it has some quirks going on. Uh, var, in fact, is subject to hoisting, which is a strange phenomenon that occurs on JavaScript in which um, even if I declare a variable after I use it, for example, let's say uh, name is Anthony and then var name. This in JavaScript is perfectly fine code because when uh, you when JavaScript processes this code, it just shifts var name up. It hoists this variable up. This doesn't instead happen with let. If you declare let here, it is declared on line four. And if it's used before it's declared, it will give you an error. So let is less permissive, let's say, and it probably behaves in a way more similar to C Sharp and Java and any other language in general. You have to declare a variable before using it. Another problem that we have with, with the var keyword is that the var keyword usually is a little, it, it expands beyond its scope. So for example, if I remember correctly, I hope I'm correct. If I do a for loop, let i is equal to zero, i is less than five, i plus plus. If I declare a variable inside of here, for example, var num is equal to two, well, the variable is actually declared outside of the scope of the for loop. And it behaves exactly like this which is strange because you want the variables declared inside of the for loop, inside of any block of code, to only live in the scope of that block. That's where you want to use let, because if you declare let, this number will be born, will live, and will die inside of this block of code, which is actually the behavior that every other language has. It should be like this, always, forever. And it was also a pain in the butt with the index of the for loop. If you say var i is equal to zero, it actually means that this is var i and i starts with zero, which means that then you can also use i again and see it as a dangling variable. But in, we usually want to declare a variable for the sake of the for loop and it must leave, it, was, it must be born, live and die in the for loop and I don't want to have any other eyes um, outside of the scope. So yeah, these are the two reasons why you should probably not use var anymore because it has this these features like hoisting and be available beyond its the scope of a block which doesn't don't really make sense. Nobody wants to use those. Uh, Anessa the Spy. Hi Anessa the Spy, I didn't see you before. It all makes sense now. Awesome, I'm glad that I was helpful. Oh, okay, I'm sorry for making you repeat yourself, but I greatly appreciate it very much. No worries, I think that this was a very good and important rehearsal for everybody. So, thanks a lot for asking. If I'm able to answer in a short time, I will be happy and glad to do it. 
But uh, the other question about, for example, Android development in Java, I cannot answer this in, uh, in a short way during lesson. So that thing, I will leave it for the Discord server. Hey, by the way, if you want to join the Discord server, feel free to. Uh, you should see the link in the chat. Uh, but if you cannot see the link in the chat, I'm just going to copy it and paste it here. So you can be part of the community and we can share memes, knowledge, problems, solutions, whatever you want. And, uh, and I am always available on Discord, even outside of the lesson. So whatever you want to ask, whatever you want to say, uh, that's it. I even added a rules channel in here. And as you can say, my rules in the Discord server is one, respect each other, two, do what you want really do what you want. I saw people asking me permission to share a meme or share some code. You don't need to ask permission for me. If it respects everybody else, if it's not disrespectful, then just go with it. Uh, the Discord server is your community. So you can do whatever you want. You can even discuss about Java, Android development. Strings. So we already know a lot about strings. We know that we can create strings in three different ways. We can do them single quoted, double quoted, and they behave exactly the same. We can use even backticks, which creates a template literal. So you can interpolate any JavaScript expression inside of the script, uh, of the string, which makes concatenation of strings much easier. And you can even add new lines pretty easily. Um, what else is needed to say? We can use special characters, we know about this. And there are many special characters. This is the new line that we already uh, always used. There is also this other one, the backslash R, which is a carriage return. And Windows usually uses this in combination with the new line. So whenever you, you, you are creating a new line on Windows text editors, it actually means backslash R, backslash N. It uses uh, two different characters for some reason. Uh, you can use uh, quotes, escaped with this backslash, single quote, backslash, double quotes. If you want to add a backslash to your text, you just use backslash, backslash, and it will show you backslash. If you want to add a tab, you can do backslash T. And there are other things like, um, yeah, the backspace, the form feed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can also add Unicode characters. And look at that. You can create the copyright symbol by just knowing its name. Apparently, it's a U for Unicode. And the number is 00A9, which is a deci uh, hexadecimal number. Or you can have this thing here with this code. You are using a rare Chinese hieroglyph, apparently. Or you can also use emojis if using some uh, codes. But emojis can also be just copied right away if, I, if I'm correct. So if you want an emoji here, let's say that my name is uh, this, it, it's fine. It will work. Okay? I'm going to say that the my name is this. Okay. Um, not really that important, but the most important part is how to use those strings, how you uh, interact with those strings. A string has a property called length, and we already saw it before, right? It shows how many characters are in the string, and a backslash n counts as one character. It's a special character, but it just occupies one character. If you see these kind of characters here instead, the emoji or the rare Chinese character, these probably are long are two characters long let's find out if i do this what's the length of this yes two characters as you can see these special characters needed an extra byte to be um to be listed in the in the uh in the character table in the ascii table if you remember it so this occupies two characters um if i want to access the characters I can use some strange, strange constructs here that are strange right now because we haven't seen arrays yet, but they will make a lot of sense as soon as we deal with arrays. So let's create a let string is equal to hello world, maybe written correctly. Okay. And now that we have this uh, string, if I want to see what is the first character of the string? I can do this. String of 
square bracket notation. Whoop. Uh, this is the usual. Uh, let me go to Google, for example, so it doesn't bother too much with the other things. So let's let's try again. Let string is equal to hello world. I'm going to use this thing again. Now, if I want to get the first character of the string, I can use square bracket notation. And instead of adding uh, the key of the object, because this is not a real object, it's a strange kind of object. Uh, I don't have any keys, but I know that every single character in the string is at a specific position, is in a specific index of the string. So I can uh, go with string of zero, with the square bracket notation, and it will give me a string containing the first character of the previous string. And I can do the same with string one and string two. And if I want to get to the end of the string, I have to pay extra attention because what is the length of the string? The string apparently is 12 characters long. So what is the last index? of the string. If you remember, in programming in general, we start counting from zero. In fact, we started with zero here. So the first character is called character zero. The second character is called character one, which means that the last character will actually have an index, which is the length of the whole string minus one. Everything is shifted by one when we start counting with zero. So if the string has a length of 12, the last character will be at index 11, not 12. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I should have <laughs> used a, a smaller string. 8, 9, 10, 11. The last character, the exclamation mark, is 11, which is string.length minus 1. This is a very important recipe, and we already used this kind of recipe uh, when we constructed all these ASCII triangles with asterisks. You remember? If you don't remember, just watch the previous streams on Twitch if they are still available, or on YouTube, because I have a channel on YouTube where I'm uploading all of the lessons, not the practice sessions, but all of the lessons are there, available for free for you. Uh, just look for Inglorious Coders, on YouTube and you should find a channel with a playlist with all the lessons from 0 to 17 which was the previous lesson. So if we want to get the last character of the string it's actually pretty strange. I have to do something like string of I use square bracket notation string length minus 1. This is how I get the last character in the string and I have to remember to use this minus 1 because there's no such index that equals the length of the string. I went past the length of the string. And if I do string of string.length, it's undefined, because this string is not uh, that big to have uh, a character on line 12, on, uh, on posi in position 12, okay? So, what else? We can use also this thing here, string char at zero, but I don't like it that much. I think this is pretty simple and it's pretty standard. Uh, a note for developers on other languages. In other languages such as C, Sharp, C, Java, etc., there is a distinction between the string type and the character type. They have the concept of char, which is different from a string. A char type is just one character. And a string is usually a collection of multiple characters. In JavaScript, it, everything is much simpler. We just have the string. And if I want one character of the string, it's just a string with one character inside. So we don't need to deal with two different types of, uh, prim of primitive values, string or characters. Everything is a string here. Much better. Much more, less performant, but much better for, from a readability point of view. Um, why less performant? Because a string occupies more space in memory, while the character uses less space in memory. But in, especially when dealing with front-end matters, we don't really care too much of this kind of op performance optimization. We care more for readability. Okay? Um, yep, so... Okay, this is the difference, apparently, between calling string of 1000 and string of... Uh, 
uh, string dot char at 1000. If I say string 1000, it will give me undefined for a string that is way shorter than 1000 characters. And if I say string dot char at 1000, it will give me an empty string. I don't care. There's also another another kind of loop that are probably that is probably not really that interesting right now but this is not the for in loop that we used to see for objects this is the for of loop which allows you to iterate over the characters of a string but i'm not going to show it to you right now because the for of will be much more relevant when we deal with arrays so first of all know that it exists and then we'll see it when we deal with arrays Another important thing here is that strings are immutable, which means that you can never change a string. You can always create a new copy of the string, mutated, but you will not a be able to change the string. So if you, have, um, if you have an object like the user, and this is me. If you have an object, even if this object is a constant, which would suggest that the user cannot be changed. It can be changed. You cannot change a reference to the, to the object, but you can change the object and you can say user.name is equal to uh, skills null. And you will see that the user changed somehow. I mutated this object in place. With strings, it's not like that. You cannot change a string. If you want, for example, to uh, concatenate something with a string, uh, let's say, hello world, without exclamation mark. Now I want to add an exclamation mark. But if I want to add an exclamation mark to the string, I will need to do a concatenation. But this concatenation is going to create a new string. It's not, I'm not changing the original string in place. I'm creating a new string, which is the copy of the previous one with some calculations performed. Of course, then I can uh, store the results of this calculation in the same variable. And this results in the string getting changed. But the string itself is immutable. You cannot change it. You can just reassign to the same variable the new value that you have after the computation. And that's why, for example, you cannot do such a thing that would be possible instead in an object. For example, you have a string that says hi, and you want to modify the first character in the string by using bracket notation like you would do in an object. No, this will give you an error because it's, um, it's immutable. You cannot change the string in place. What you can do, however, is that you, you, you can do something more complex. You start with a string with a capital H and then you create a, a new string or you just override the same variable by saying, OK, the first character should be the lowercase h and then I attach, I concatenate whatever is the value of the second character. But this is not a mutable string. This is an immutable string created from as a as a result of this uh, computation, which then is stored in the same variable. Uh, if you want to change the case, you know you can use two uppercase, but you can also use two lowercase in order to put everything to lowercase. Um, if you want just one character to be low and it should be lowercase, you can do interface of zero dot to lowercase. Can you do something like string one is equal to h plus string one to ten to get the rest of the string? Ooh, this is a very interesting question. Yes, you can. You can do something similar, but not exactly like you say. You're probably using some uh, Excel style syntax, which is very similar to the JavaScript syntax. Um, I'm going to show you right now with some methods that we have. Yes, you can do something like this, but not right now, in a while. Um, there are other methods that you can apply to strings. For example, you can look for the index of some substring. So, for example, there is a string called widget with ID, and uh, you can check if this string contains widget with a capital W. This string.index of widget will give you zero because the substring widget is at the beginning of the string. So it starts at index zero of the string. Uh, 
If you instead look for a widget with a lowercase w, uh, this substring with the lowercase letter, with the lowercase w, doesn't exist in the string. So the index that will be returned is minus 1, which is an invalid index because strings start with 0 to length minus 1, and minus 1 yeah, and minus one itself is not a valid value. So in order to say that the substring does not exist in the string, this kind of value will be provided to you. Uh, an impossible value, minus one. If you want to look at string of index of ID, you could be tempted to say that ID is here, but there is another one that's an ID here. And string index of ID will give you the index of the first occurrence that it finds. So it will give you one in this case because the first occurrence of id or id found on the string is at position one, which is the second character in the string. If I remember correctly, there's also a last index of if you really want to start from the bottom. So let's find out. Uh, let what was that? Let string is equal to what was that? Widget with id. Widget with ID. This is my string. And if I do string index of ID, it will give me one because at position one, at index one, I start finding the first occurrence of ID. Maybe there's also a last index of. Yes, there is one. And apparently, if I look for the last index of ID, it will give me 12 because probably this I is at index 12. I'm not really sure, so I'm just going to count. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, yeah, this is the 12th character. And in fact, I can also look for string of 12, and it's an I, and string of 13, it's a D. So, yeah, it's actually where it's supposed to be, okay? Okay, so we've got index of and we also have last index of. You can have a look at all these ex examples, exercises together. I don't think that it would be really, really useful for me to show you this kind of uh, code right now. I want to go with the important part that are difficult to understand. But if you understood how a function works or how a loop works, and if you start using these kind of... Uh, string index of, last index of, you should be able to do those by yourself. Oh, there's a second parameter too in index of, which means ignore from this index onward. So in this case, for example, oh, I hate these post things. If I try string index of id, but starting from index 2, it's going to ignore the first occurrence because the first occurrence was on index 1. So you want to skip from a certain index onward. You want to skip 0, skip 1, start looking for ID from index 2. And the only thing that really corresponds to ID from this index is just the last ID that I see here. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just syntax, something to learn almost by heart. Or, as I always say, you don't need to learn them by heart completely, you just remember, put them on the back of your head, just remember that they exist. And at a certain point, when you need them, you will say, hmm, there was something that was already available, or maybe you don't want, you don't remember it, you just Google it. Uh, search for substring starting from index in JavaScript. Ooh, it goes to index of a method of the string uh, object. Uh, don't worry about this prototype, it doesn't matter. And if you look at this documentation, it will show you probably that, yep, the syntax of index of is given the string, I'm asking the string, hey, give me the index of this substring, and optionally, I can provide where, from where I want to perform the search from index. So you can have a look at the parameters, the return value, all the possible uh, examples. The developer Mozilla network is really, really good at answering to your, to your questions. Uh, or probably you will also find a question on Stack Overflow, of course. So 
This guy wants to look for SDG, but he wants to also find the first S that is found after SDG. So how can I do this? And there's a guy that say, hey, you can just combine things together. You can just do this and this and that. Uh, well, this is not really using the second parameter of index of, but maybe there is some, ooh, here it is. One guy is actually telling, hey, there is a second parameter that you can use for its index of, so you can do it like this. So as you can see, Stack Overflow is really, really helpful. Not always the first answer, sometimes also the second answer. You, you look for the number of votes. Uh, this doesn't have many votes and it's the accepted answer by the, uh, the, the person asking the question. But this should probably be the accepted answer because it gives you a real answer with, which is much easier than all this stuff. Um, okay, so last index of, index of, the bitwise not trick, I'm not going to show it to you, I don't even know what it is and I don't want to know it. Oh, there's also another couple of methods here, nice. Uh, includes is just giving you true or false if this string has this other string as a subset, as a substring. So if this string includes widget, it will tell you true, otherwise it will tell you false, like in this case. Okay, just boolean. It doesn't give you the index of where widget is, it just gives you true or false. Uh, again, optional parameter if you want to check if it's available, if the substring is there starting from index 3. And in this case it's not, because index 3 should be 0, 1, 2, 3. Starting from the G, if you look at get, get doesn't contain ID. So this will give you false. <clears throat> A substring can be anywhere in the string. It could be in the middle, it could be at the beginning, it could be at the end of the string. If you really want to check if this substring is at the beginning or at the end of the string, there's a convenient method called starts with or ends with. So you can check if wid is at the start of the string or get is at the end of the string. You don't want to check if it's contained. You just want to check if it's at the end or at the start. If you want to get a substring, and finally I can start showing Angelo what I was meaning, there is a convenient method here called slice, which allows you to specify the start of the substring that you want to create, the start of the slice that you want to create, and optionally the end. Why optionally? Because if you don't specify the end, it will slice from that position towards to the end of the string. So let's find out with um, this one here. Let string widget with ID. If I do str.slice starting from, uh, I don't know, 9, it shows the ID because apparently the T here is on position 9. And I created a substring, a slice from TH up to the end. But if I want to do 9 to 11, then it reminds me a little bit of that uh, Trump meme. <laughs> okay, so I'm starting from 9 and I'm ending to 11 excluded. So this is uh, index 9, index 10, and then I'm just going to omit uh, index 11. So 9 to 11 excluded. And now you can see that this slice is just a shorthand for str slice to from 9 to str dot length excluded. It gives you exactly the same results. Okay, so the first index is included, but the end is always excluded. In mathematical terms, for those who you know or who know it, you use this notation here, right? Uh, so the start is included and the end is excluded. This is math, this is not programming. And I'm just doing this for the engineers, physicists, mathematicians that we have in the audience, okay? Okay, a uh, slice is very flexible. You can even use negative numbers. And if you use negative numbers, it will just start counting from the right instead of from the left. So let me see what happens if oh, I, I hit this post. You know what? I'm going to go to my website, Inglorious Coders, 
because my website doesn't give you any stupid messages. Okay, so this is the string. If I want to do a slice, uh, for example, minus two, this is giving me a slice starting from uh, two characters from the end till the end. Or I can do from four characters to the end till two characters to the end. And it's giving me H space. Let's find out with the five and three. And we already, and we still have the thump, the, the trump thick meme, okay? So we can start counting from right by just using negative numbers. Hope it makes sense. Um, there's also another thing called substring. And substring, if, you, if I remember correctly, uh, it should just behave the same. Oh, that's it. Substring apparently is exactly like slice, but it allows a start to be greater than end. So I can do substring from six to two and will still give you ring. I never use this in my life and I think we should never use this in our lives because I think it's, it's uh, misleading to use a start index which is greater than the end index. So I would probably say just don't use substring, use slice. Better. Uh, there's also another one which is substr. And substr is slightly different because you, you have the starting index and you have the length, not the index of the last, uh, of the end. You just have the, the length. So if I want to do substr from four and with a length of two, it will just give me a substring of length 2 starting from position 4. Length 5 will give me a string of length 5 starting from position 4. It's actually pretty difficult to tell the difference between slice, substring and subst. In fact, I probably usually mess up and probably I just use slice every single time. Because if you want to have a length of 5 and you don't want to use subst, you can still do it with slice. str.slice starting from 4. And if you want a length of 5, you can probably just say 4 plus 5. And this is the index of where you want to stop your string. So it's pretty easy to just, you know, um, to, to convert from this notation to this notation. Maybe this is easier to read and write, but if you are stuck with not remembering what is the these numbers, what do these numbers do, then just stick with one of them and that's fine. Um, as you saw, luckily we also have the IntelliSense from our tools, which help us a little bit in uh, understanding how to work with those methods. So substring has a from and optionally, that's the reason of the question mark, and optionally a length. And if I instead use slice, it will tell me from optional start to optional end. What? Also the start is optional? Yes, it is optional. In fact, if I say string slice, it will just create a new copy of the string, of the whole string. It's a substring containing all the characters from the previous string. Angelo, can you replace the length 5 argument with example an object property like, let's uh, read the... I'm sorry, I forgot to, to, to change the setting. I'm going to do it for real. So can you replace the length 5 argument with example an object property like size strength.length or variable value? <laughs> Thanks Angelo for trying as much as you can to, 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 to go forward me, uh, to go towards me. Um, yes, you can. Yes, you can definitely can. Um, in fact, we probably did something similar with slice. I showed you something like, yep, slice from 9 to string.length. This worked. And you can do exactly the same with the, the substring. But as you can see, string.length is a number which is too big for the string. Because we don't have a substring of this string starting from this position which is 
long just as much as the original string. So this is pretty impossible. But yes, you can do uh, starting from user.age if my age is small enough and if I have an object called user which has an age. So yes, you can combine everything as you please. Uh, we can try. Um, let's create a const token, I don't know, token length of three. Okay, I've got an object. Usually when I put these on a single line, I prefer to add an extra space here to improve readability. And Preacher, the tool that auto-formats our code, usually agrees with me. So this is an object called token, which has a length of three. And if I want to use substr from uh, index two to the length of that token, yes, I can use it. And apparently the result is j. Okay. TGE. Um, what else? What else? What else? You can compare strings. We already know how to compare strings, so I'm going to skip completely all of this. It seems strange that A is greater than Z, but this is because in the character map, in the table where all these strings are mapped with specific number IDs, the lowercase a comes after the all the uppercase letters so alphabetically speaking lowercase a is greater than c and uh, special characters like this o is greater than any other uh, uppercase letter with no special uh, accents there because that's how they are stored in the character map on our computers we saw that we could have these kind of uh, methods like code point at zero will give me the, the the number the id the numeric number associated with that character but we don't really care about these things uh, it's advanced stuff that probably we don't really care about you can do a for loop here starting from 65 to 220 included and you can check what are these all these uh, strings associated with all the numeric key codes. So, for example, string from code port 65 is A, capital A, and 66 will be B, 67 will be C, etc., etc. And then after all these capital letters, you will have some strange characters, and then you will have all the lowercase characters, and then you have some other strange characters, and then you will have all these symbols, and then you will have all these accented characters, just play around with it and you will see now it is clear why A is greater than capital Z because it goes, it, it is a number, it is stored as a number greater than the capital uh, letter. Blah, 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 blah. There's also a locale compare that I never saw before and I don't really care uh, apart from when I have to create dictionaries probably. But yeah, there is a locale compare if you want to use it. Uh, here it's telling you that some special characters occupy two characters. Two sy a symbol like this emoji will occupy two characters. And blah, blah, blah. We don't really care too much about this stuff. And that's it for strings. I think it's fine. Let's go to the real meat of this lesson, okay? Let's go with arrays. Arrays are pretty important. And it's probably as important as objects. As they put it really, really well here, objects already allow you to store keyed collections of values. So I, when I presented to you objects, I told you that that was a convenient way to store multiple values instead of uh, creating a new variable for every single value. You just store them in one object, in one huge collection of values. So you declare just one thing, and then you put properties inside of that object. And that is fine already, as the tutorial says. But sometimes we want these values to be stored in an ordered collection, in which the order in which these properties are is important and you want to keep it consistent with objects ordering is not really that consistent sometimes you just need to have a collection of elements 
that you don't even need to name. I just want to have an element, the first element, the second element, the third element. You want to get those elements positionally. And this is really, really similar to what we already said about strings. In fact, when I have a string like this one, where is it? And I want to get the fourth, the, the, five, the fifth character of the string. So the string, the, the character in string at position four, I'm looking positionally for that character. In fact, strings are actually a special case of arrays. Well, probably they are not implemented exactly as arrays, but we don't really care about that. But a string is a collection of characters that don't need to have a name. They don't need to have a, to be a collection of character with every character having a name. We just need to store the position. I want the character at position zero, position one, position two, position three. And that's it. And sometimes you need, it, you need it to be like this. Sometimes you want to have a collection which allows you to even change easily the order in which things are specified. For example, let me see if this applies for uh, this kind of application here. I'm um, going to look at it here. This is a stupid application of to-dos. And I will say, learn JavaScript. This is the first thing that we want to do. And then I want to also seek for a job. And then I can just forget everything because I have a salary. Okay, these items are in exactly this order here. In some scenarios, but apparently not this one, unfortunately, I can even change the order. In, I, I can change the placement, which would be nuts because you cannot learn JavaScript, forget everything and then seek for a job. You should first seek for a job and then you probably can forget everything. But uh, apparently it's not working in this case. But sometimes in, a, in some applications, you want to have a list of items listed in a certain order. And then you want to just move items around and specify a different order. You don't really care about the name of the item that you are placing. You just want to care about the position. And the position is very well defined with just a number. Position 0, position 1, position 2, position 3, etc, etc. So it's just an index. And arrays allow you to do exactly this. Instead of creating an object in which every single element in the object must have a name, you just create an array in which you store objects and they keep the order consistent. And you can change the order also. So, how do you declare an array? Well, I stopped uh, creating things here. For, so, so, for example, I should probably continue here. Uh, arrays, yes. How do you create an array? Well, if you create an object with uh, curly braces, const obj is equal to curly braces, you define an array with square brackets, const r is equal to square brackets. And this is an empty array. Just like with objects, you could have also something like obj is equal to new object or something like that. And you can do the same with arrays, const r is equal to new array, but don't do it. Just don't. Use the literal uh, representation. This is an object literal, this is an array literal, and we like them better, okay? There's no real need to use new array, or sometimes you just see it as array, which is even more confusing. So this is an object literal, and it's good. This is an array literal, and it's really good. These are, I don't know, constructors, and we don't like them. In fact, I'm going to keep them commented. I don't know if they call it constructor here. Let's see. Um, yeah, well, it's using a constructor, yes. Okay, so an empty array is like this. And if you want to fill it, it's even easier than with an object. Because the object, if you don't want to have it uh, empty, you have to specify a key and a value. But with arrays, let's say key one, value one, and key two, value two. But with arrays, you don't really care about the name of the values that you are storing. You just store them positionally. So you have value one and value two. And just like with strings, you can access the properties of the array 
by using square bracket notation. So R of zero will give you the string value one, not one character, the whole string. And R of one will give you the string value two. Uh, it, it can be anything. It can be not only strings. It can be a number and uh, let's say number 42 and r of 2 will give me the value 42 the number 42 and you can store whatever you can put null you can put undefined you can put objects you can put other arrays you can put functions you can put whatever you want and this goes with objects too now that we know arrays well, yes, you can also put arrays in an object. So, for example, an object can be a user. The user has a name, as always, as an age, 38. And it has limbs, which could be an array, like uh, left arm, right arm, uh, left leg, and right leg. I don't care what am I writing? <laughs> I don't really care how to name them. I just want to have them stored in uh, a positional structure. And I can always get user.limbs of zero to get the left arm, user uh, limbs of one to get the right arm, etc, etc. So as you can see, we can combine things together. So, fruits. It's an array of three different fruits. I don't care about their names. I care about the values. And if I want to get the apple, I can just say fruits of zero. I want to get the orange, I say fruits of one, etc, etc. And I can also change items in the array positionally. So, fruits of two is equal to pair. This will change the value plum into pair. I'm replacing the value. I can even add a new element to the array by saying fruit three of lemon, mm, but it's strange. Mm, let me check if this is true because I have some doubts about it. Let fruits is equal to, let's do, well, I don't want to have fruits. I want to have just numbers, uh, one, two, and three. I don't know if this works, but if it works, it's a new addition. So I can get numbers of zero, and that's fine. I will have one. I'll have numbers of one, which is two. I have numbers of two, which is three. I can even change numbers of one by saying that this is four. And I'm changing the second element, the element in position one. And yes, if I inspect the numbers, now they changed because two is now become four but they say that I can even add a property by adding it to an, an index that doesn't exist yet. So this would be five, for example. Is it this really going to work? What? It works. I can assure you that this never worked before. I don't know if this is new. Let's, say, let's see if, uh, if they say it's new. They don't say it. Oh my god, this is really, really new to me. Add element to array with square brackets. Wasn't a repush or something? Yeah, exactly. I knew about a repush, but not with this, uh, not, not like this. Yeah, in fact, people say you have to use push. But maybe this is a new addition. Uh, remove data structures, objects and arrays. Isn't there, okay, index collections. Maybe we can find something here. I can't believe that uh, it is possible and nobody is speaking about this. This is a huge thing. Okay, 
Yeah, populating an array. You can populate an array by assigning values to its element. For example, you can do it like this. Note, if you supply a non-integer value to the array operator in the code above, a property will be created in the object, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I can assure you I have an experience of, well, I started in 2012. So I have an experience of how many? Nine years in JavaScript. And I never thought that this could be possible. I thought that this would give you an error. And I'm still pretty convinced that maybe uh, less modern browsers didn't allow you to do this. Property accessors. Let me see if there is any compatibility. No, you can use it in any single situation, even Internet Explorer 3. Well, th yeah, this is for objects, not for arrays, though. Let's see if there is a compatibility table for this thing too here. Uh, rebuffer, blah, blah, blah. Okay, no information here. This is pretty interesting. Uh, I'll have to, to inspect a little further. So you would have to do user.limbs of one is equal to right ear, ear to change right arm into right ear equivalent to object syntax. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, if uh, I have this object that contains a property which is an array and i want to change the second element so right arm and say that my right ear is an uh, is a limb i can replace it like this user dot limbs which uh, allows me to get into this property of one which gives me the second parameter uh, the, the second value in the array is equal to right ear so i'm going to override the right arm with the right ear let's uh let's try it there we are let's see how the user is shaped now the user is an object that has an age has a name and has an array called limbs which has a second limb being my right ear as you can see there is the array keyword specified somewhere and as you can see the order in which these properties are specified is not the same order in which i specified them here i said name age and limbs and i see the object having age limbs and name they are ordered differently in the object and that's why we need arrays if we want to keep the order consistent the array will make sure that the order remains the same but objects sometimes have the freedom to arrange our items in a different order for example i think that here the order is alphabetical because age comes before limbs which comes before name so that's why we need arrays that's why arrays are still relevant and you sometimes prefer arrays rather than objects arrays have a length just like let's say user limbs because it's an array uh, they have a length, just like strings, because strings are just an array of characters. And arrays have other properties, very interesting properties. Arrays can be of any kind. So as you can see, this array contains one string, an object, a Boolean value, even a function. And you can access anything in, from inside of this array for example r of one will get you to the second value stored in the array and since it's an object you can do r of one dot name to get the value john and angelo you can also assign a new value because everything inside of the array or inside of the object is mutable and if the value inside of the array is a function, you can even invoke that function, r of 3 parentheses, because r of 3 allows me to get into the fourth property of the array, the one stored at index 3. And since it's a function, I can just invoke it right away. Or I can store it in a variable, blah, blah, blah. Just a note about um, syntax, trailing commas is something that we already saw in objects. Uh, trailing commas are usually a good thing because if you have an array that has multiple values, please go to a new line. Nope. I have to put other limbs. I have to put my nose as a limb 
and I probably have to add something else. Uh, let's not be not even. Uh, let, let's not go into I say not family friendly stuff. Uh, nose, brain. What else could be my a limb of mine? It's not a limb. Let's say body. My body parts are nose. Well, brain, yeah, could be my body part. I can put my torso. Okay, finally, I made the array so long that Pritya decided to put every value on a new line. And as you can see, Pritya by default adds the trailing comma. The trailing comma is very useful because if I want to change the order in which these values are is defined, I can just alt up and down and move things around and things will still work the same. If I don't have this trailing comma and move things up and down, I have an error because I need to add this extra comma. But a trailing comma does everything for me. And trailing comma is useful in arrays and in objects too. As you can see, there's a trailing comma in here too because this is the last property and I can move this last property around and have no errors in my code because of that trailing comma. Trailing commas are um, useful and allowed in JavaScript. In other languages, I think that they are not available. I don't know if Java now supports trailing commas, but when I used to study and use Java, it didn't have trailing commas. Um, okay, yeah, all the questions are already answered. Now, if you want to add things to an array or remove things from an array, um, this is where things are slightly confusing for me because we already saw that in order to add a new value, um, you can do something like this. Let watchers is equal to Angelo. Oops, sorry. Sao. Tiago. These are the real names of your nicknames, the ones that I know. Bobby. If you want to share your real name uh, skills now, or uh, also Anes the Spy, feel free to share your, your real name. I'm going to do skills now. Okay, that's it. These are my current watchers, or at least the ones that I know about. Probably I'm forgetting someone, I'm sorry for that. If I want to add a new watcher here, I can do it apparently like this. Watchers of, I have to know the length, watchers of length, watchers dot length, is equal to, this is the new watcher that I'm going to add, and the watcher that I'm going to add is Anes the spy. I can do it like this, apparently. I didn't know. How did you write it in multiple lines when I tried it pretty adjusted to one line? Uh, you see that, you saw that I, I, I wrote multiple values here. Um, Prettier tries to keep everything in one line if it's possible. But if the amount of values is too much, is goes way beyond the 80 characters uh, of length in the text editor, then Prettier decides to put everything on a new line. So it's automatic. You just need to add more properties or longer properties and at a certain point Pritier will decide okay that's it I'm going to go to a new line I'm not going to put everything on the same line that's why I had to change my limbs into my body okay so this is one way to add things I wouldn't recommend it also because it's pretty difficult to uh, add watches.length here there's also another way to add things to an array, and this way is called push. If you push an S the spy to watchers, it will return a value, and the, return, uh, the value that is returned is the new length of the array. The array contained five elements, Angelo, Sao, Tiago, Bobby, Skills, Null, no, five elements. And now that I pushed an S the spy, we've got six elements in the array. And if I want to inspect watchers, I will see that there are six elements now, right? Look at this, the representation of this array looks a lot like an object because the key is the index and the value 
is, well, the value that is stored. In fact, we can think of arrays as a special kind of object that has a key, which is just a number, and the value, which is whatever value you want. But as you know, objects do not allow you to put anything else than a string as keys. That's why an array is not just a special kind of object. Uh, it's not a subset of objects. It's a very special kind of object that allows to do other things and doesn't allow you to do other things. So an object has key value pairs and the keys are always strings. An array instead has keys which are always numbers and they are the index where the element is posi positioned. Okay, so you can push things. And just like you can push things, you can unshift things. Very strange as a name. Let's see what unshift does. No way. Guys, No way. I'm pretty sure you're not there with me, but we there was a power shortage 